we are back. Oh, we are back with the <laughs> most uh, informative, but mm -hmm. also possibly a little bit boring <laughs> show about the Portland real estate market. And we're going to talk today about housing data from July, year to date, trends that we're seeing. And we're going to talk about how it's impacting people who are thinking about buying and selling. Maybe even we'll sneak in some things for people that are thinking about buying and selling later. So that's okay too. Um, maybe answer some questions like, should you be a buyer? Should you be a seller? You know, it is not always the right time to buy contrary to popular belief, because that is a personal decision. So why don't we just start out? I'm going to ask you a question. I don't often ask you, Krista, before we get into data, let's just get a sense since you've been out shopping with clients recently, you have seven or eight transactions pending. It's like the market temperature. Like, how are you feeling like with buyers in the market? How are buyers feeling right now that you've been working with? It's really interesting. So I've also been working with a lot of first time home buyers, but buyers in general, and it really depends on the price point. So I've got some first time home buyers that are looking in that $500,000 range. And we're seeing a lot more multiple offers, homes going quicker. Um, when you write those multiple offers, the terms are a little bit better for the sellers. But then I have some buyers that are all maybe looking in that 700 to $900,000 range. And we're looking at four to five houses in a day, maybe more because they're sitting, we're going back and we're looking at them multiple times. I have one where we made an offer, they made a counter. And so we went back to look at it again with family and the counter offer, they came down $50,000 from list price, which so, is so crazy. Let's so let's pause real quick and let's compartmentalize these a little bit. Okay. You know, if you're buying a home under the average sales price in an area, and we're talking about the Portland Metro area right now, Chris mm -hmm. is talking about first time home buyers around 500,000. Well, the average sales price in Portland is 600,000. And a general but very accurate statement would be anything above the average or anything below the average sales price is the most active place in the market. Mm -hmm. And the more affordable you go, you have first time home buyers, you have investors, and generally you have people downsizing. Mm -hmm. It's always been my belief that anything below the average sales price, the first time home buyer market and the other people who participate there, it's the most crowded, most competitive, actually sometimes hardest space mm -hmm. to purchase a house in. And those terms generally favor a seller. So let's say you own one of those properties mm -hmm. and you've outgrown it. You have, kids, you know, whatever's happened, right? You just outgrown that house. What Chris is talking about is this really beautiful move. We've talked about or talked about with people for over a decade, which is generally if you're selling in the bottom of the market, I don't want to say bottom, the lower, the lower priced part of the markets, mm -hmm. you're selling in a seller's market. And as you increase your purchase price, there's less and less buyers mm -hmm. and the market becomes softer. And you might be selling in a seller's market, buying in a buyer's market, as Krista was alluding to, when representing home buyers in a more expensive price point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they have a lot more options. They're able to go back and the offers we're making, you know, they're also getting repairs or closing costs. And this isn't for every single one, right? I don't wanna tell you, hey, go, if you're looking in this range, this is gonna happen. It really depends a lot on too, what's going on with that seller. But it is more of a buyer's market is from what I am seeing with my buyers. Yeah. So let's get into some data and then maybe, I don't know if we'll discuss market segment stuff at all, but let's get into some data. If you've been watching this, if you're first time watching it, um, hey, new listings, that's a leading indicator to what's going to be happening in the market. Not the most important indicator, but, but important. Um, we've been record or we've been seeing a 30 year low of new listings coming to the market. That is still the truth. We had 2,899 new listings come to the market during the month of July. That is a 21% decrease from last or sorry, 12% decrease from last month. Not very important stat by the way. And a 23% decrease from last year, more important, right? less people are choosing to be sellers in today's market. Now, why is that? Because most people actually don't want a 7% mortgage. Yeah. I don't, 
right? If it was the per, if it was the right house, I would. But in order to trade out of my three and a half percent mortgage, I'm going to have to really find the right house, or the circumstances are going to need to be right. So you're seeing less people bring their homes to the market with new listings. I think it's really important to know this is something we've been watching. If you go to HillshireRealtyGroup.com, we have a counter on our website that it updates every 15 minutes and it tells you how many homes are actively on the market. So it's a good place to search for homes. If you're watching this and need a place to search for homes, probably in the description, actually I know for sure there's a link to the website. So you can search for homes there, but we have this counter and it says there are 4,276 homes on the market right now. So there's a lot of options. Krista, what would, speak, to, speak to just new listings for a second. So yeah, there we have what, 4,000 homes overall just sitting, right? That with a 30 year low of, of homes coming to the market. And I'm getting a lot of, you know, so a lot of people are out there, it's like, oh, we have a listing shortage, we have a listing shortage. But we have 4,000 houses out there that aren't selling, right? That aren't sitting. Or haven't sold yet. Or haven't sold yet. I'm gonna so, pick a fight with you through the wall real quick. I hate yeah. the word sitting on the market because they're just, like? they're just they're just <laughs> listed for sale, right? Because sometimes you're not like to me sitting implies it's overpriced or mm -hmm. it's bad. It feels like a bad word in real yeah. estate. So, <laughs> but we we it's like you're in timeout. It's like <laughs> these these 4,200 <laughs> homes are in timeout. Um, there's but there are 4,200 homes that are available for sale. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, anyway, I had to pick a fight with you on the sitting word. Cause every time I hear you say it, I want to be like, Krista, no, but that's there just 4,200 homes on the market. Listed for sale. Yeah. Listed for sale. Okay. All right. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to upset you and I don't want to be in time out. No. <laughs> All right. So we've got 4,200 homes that are currently listed on the market right now. So there are options out there, but what we say, there's what two homes for every seller. There's about two homes for every buyer right now. Two homes yeah. for every buyer, right? So buyers have more options, right? Which makes a little bit more competition amongst the sellers. And once again, it depends on what price point we're looking at where that happens. So there are, we do have listings and people are not, and I, I mean, I don't know about you. Are you getting a lot of the, because I have some buyers that are looking in a certain market and they're not seeing a lot coming that getting listed that are in the price point that they want, right? It just seems like yeah. listings are coming on slower. Well, you know? I think there's a couple of things, right? If you're if you're looking for new listings below 500,000 that are detached homes with a three car garage, you probably won't see any. Yeah. Right, like those don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a detached home under 500,000 with a shop, hard, right? Like there, we do have a 30 year low of new listings coming to the market. So not seeing things you like actually like that feels like it should be normal, right? If we said, if we, without, with ignoring everything else about the market, if there was a 30 year low of new listings come to the market, that does mean that there are less new options for you. Yeah. The fact that there's 4,200 homes on the market, it means there's options and because those options might allow an ability to go negotiate mm -hmm. the price of those homes is likely to come down a lot of them and we'll talk about pricing later um, which also might allow you to make that the home you want over time right like i don't want formica countertops i want quartz right but if you have formica countertops in in a house you probably want new cabinets too because uh you're probably not gonna put quartz where formica used to be those cabinets are probably gonna suck it all it all starts to add up and that's a real yeah. slippery slope sometimes yeah but going going to your point about pending sales last month there were 2145 pending sales and there's a trend as we've had seven percent interest rates we've experienced around 2000 sales a month now what did it look like pre 7% interest rates? Well, it looked like 3000 pending sales a month, 3,500. That's what we would see historically in the month of July, the month of June. We have a lot fewer pending sales. Now we could point to new listing inventory as part of that, but not really because 26% of the homes that have listed for sale this year have not yet sold. That's affordability. That is, hey, not everyone can afford a $48,000 a year housing payment or a $60,000 a year housing payment, 
right? Which is what we're starting to see a little bit more commonly. Um, that's putting downward pressure on the amount of people that are buying, which ultimately is putting downward pressure on pricing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, did you see my Instagram the other day? I shared a reel from like last October and I had, I had a good little stubble beard going. I thought yeah. Annabelle yeah. in the back seat. I thought it was good. Um, but it's from October and I was like, what if interest rates don't come down? What if we just <laughs> live in a high interest rate environment? What if a new month of the new normals, we only have 2000 sales. What are we going to do? Right? Like what's going to happen in the market? Now we can answer some of those questions today where last year we were talking about it as like a, what if they stay? And that video was a rebuttal to all the real estate agents saying home values are going to come down tomorrow. Cause last October, yeah, or interest, you know, interest rates, interest, or interest rates, rates, sorry, interest yeah. rates last, last, uh, October, uh, what was it? Um, Marry the house, date the rate. Oh, no yeah. oh I'm, no I'm guilty of that. I oh, definitely no. was like, but no I loved that saying. I thought it was but great. No one, but no one says it anymore. <laughs> nope. Because well, I, love, I love what you said. Like, when you, you, you asked me this question, you're like, Krista, like, why do they have to come down? And that's a good question. It's like, they don't. You're right. Like, they don't have to come down. And I think right now, what we're seeing and like for me all of a sudden like business has gotten busier like my fir my first half of this year was was a lot slower and a lot of that were people were scared people didn't know what was going to happen now it does not look like interest rates are coming down to that five in the near future so people are now ready kind of made made their peace with okay this is what they are well what can i afford well you know here here's something that's interesting um people's plans don't change they just get delayed so if yeah. I needed if I needed to buy a house a year ago, I probably still need to today. Maybe the the house buyer that just wanted a nicer backyard or the third bay in the garage, maybe those buyers are out of the market. Uh, maybe not, depending on what happened with them at work. You know, we have plenty of clients that are taking on higher mortgages because they want to. Mm -hmm. um, but there are less there are less of those. But people's plans don't change; they just get delayed. Let's talk about this, and we'll just lead this into price, and we'll talk about closed sales. Um, if my plans got changed or if they just delayed, but they didn't change, I still want to sell. Yeah. And I'm selling in a marketplace where there's two homes on the market for every buyer. That's going to put downward pressure on pricing, which we've seen the average sales price in Portland has declined by three and a half percent Portland Metro area. Um, year over year, we've had eight consecutive months where the average sales price was less than the same month the year before dating back to December. So all the realtors are like, are you sure the market's going down? Or is it just certain price points? Yeah, certain price points are doing okay. Certain suburban areas are doing okay. But we're talking about the Portland metro area as a whole. When there's an oversupply of, in of inventory, which we have, we can have 2.4 months of inventory and at the current pace of sales have an oversupply. It's not rocket science, right? Um, that can happen. People that have built equity historically over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, clearly they're willing to give some of it up to sell their house. Mm -hmm. And we were having a conversation in the office that between 20, these aren't exact numbers, so please don't quote me, but they're going to be close. Over uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022, the market appreciated by 31%. Now, the average rate of appreciation, if we round up over the last 30 years in the Portland metro area, was 6%. So 31 minus 18 13%. Could we give up 13% on home values? Last year, I predicted home values were going to come down around 5% and we're pacing that it makes me feel really smart. <laughs> For the last couple of months, I've been saying, I think we could potentially lose five to 10% in home values if interest rates stay above six and a half percent you know, for the foreseeable future. These are all interest rate based, by the way. Um, if interest rates go to 5%, we're going to be standing in lines for houses because then we really will have an undersupply. Like yeah. I heard someone make the analogy the other day. It's a rubber band getting pulled back, getting ready to snap. Lots of buyers will come to the marketplace. That is the truth. We have an undersupply of homes being built in Portland, Portland metro area, because it's too expensive to build houses here, right? Like the permits yeah, the on permits these houses... You want affordable housing in Portland, um, elect new people to change the permit cost because it will never happen under the current cost structure of permits. It, it can't, you can't have housing affordability with the cost of permits. 
but but I digress. <laughs> right? Um, That's a whole other podcast. A whole other podcast. <laughs> the average sales price is declined three and a half percent. And you do have home sellers now that are willing to give up some of those historic that historical appreciation that you know averaged out six percent a year over thirty years. If I have to give up a year so I can move on and go to the, my next stage in life, mm -hmm. I'm going to be willing to do it. And there's two types of sellers in the market, those fiercely protecting their equity and then the type of seller that I just talked about. And the type of seller I just talked about, they're the ones that are dictating the terms of the market. At some point, if you want to move, you want to move. Yeah. Whew. I just said so a lot of words. You did. So how does it affect, so, I mean, how does that affect home pricing, right? When you're going to price your home for sellers, right? Yeah. So if I walked into a store and there are 10 hats that I really like, and they're all really similar. Maybe there's a certain color that's on sale. That's what I'm going to buy. Like I wear a lot of the same shirt. I have like, I just buy the same shirt in different colors. Yes, you do. And the reality <laughs> is sometimes some of those colors are on sale and other times that same color or the, the other colors are not on sale. And I have a tendency to buy the shirt with the color that I like, that's a better deal. And I know it's like, it might be a silly analogy, but it's true. We all do it, right? In certain oh, price yeah. points. Of yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of that too. So, yeah. I mean, cause sometimes the deal is too good to pass up or it makes you stop and think twice, right? If you think about the Portland housing market and let's get out of historical homes, let's, let's move into the suburbs for a minute. Mm -hmm. You have subdivisions of 400 houses where there's five floor plans. And I'm gonna choose the one that's the best deal and the best condition on the street that I like. And, and the streets aren't very different, right? So that becomes a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. There's certain price points right now where, you know, I looked, at, I looked at a very expensive home a couple weeks ago. And in this price band, um, there's like nine homes pending, but there's 60 some odd homes listed for sale not everyone's going to sell. Now, then there's certain price bands you go look in and there's nothing available. And that home's going to sell and it's probably going to sell multiple offers because it means there's there's better or bigger buyer demand. So if I'm a seller, what does this mean? God, it's it really depends, right? <laughs> it depends on what neighborhood you're in, what your price point is. There's so many factors. It's what actually, what I love about real estate is uh, for a guy whose brain needs new things every day, <laughs> Real estate is new things, every day. <laughs> new, new neighborhoods, new personalities, easy negotiation, hard negotiation. There's so many variables. The market isn't just a straight line and every house yeah. is the same thing. Everything is so variable. Love that about it. Yeah. Um, but, but, you, know but what... like you know who doesn't like that? Engineers. Engineers. <laughs> they want... Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people out there, right? That's really, really hard when you work with them. It's like, I need exact. And it's just... By there the way, is. her her dad's an her dad's an engineer. That's why she's saying it. He's my worst client. Um, client, love you, dad. But but if but. I if I'm a seller and I'm looking at the market across the board, here's what I need to know: consumer confidence is down, interest rates are up, affordability is down. Um, buying a home takes a higher percentage of my income. Um, there's been eight consecutive months where the average sales price was less than the year before. Um, we have inventory that's stacking up. Uh, we have 4,200 homes on the market and we only had 2,200 buyers last month, roughly. Um, it's not the ideal conditions if we're looking at averages, um, but there could still be an opportunity because here's the reality. I, my personal belief is if interest rates stay above six and a half percent, home values will also decline in 2024. So if your plans have been delayed, if you can afford to delay them for three, four, five years potentially and lose some value, you know, that's okay. Cause you, maybe the place you're going loses some value, but here's the reality for our out of state movers. Lots of markets are up. I was talking to my friend today on the East coast and where she lives, the average sales price is up 8% year over year. And I coach a lot of people in real estate and in their respective markets, you know, home values aren't down across the country I, as an average, they've increased. So, if you're thinking about selling in 2024, maybe you should sell in 2023. If you're thinking about selling in 2025, what would it look like to move your timeline forward? 
Are you in the position to do that? If you're thinking about making a local move, what are you thinking about buying on the other side? And is that actually a better asset? Um, doing this since 2007, what I could tell you is not all neighborhoods appreciate the same rate. And there are certain neighborhoods that just kind of cap out. And some of those neighborhoods did really well during the recession because they were so undervalued, they shot up really fast. Um, those are the ones that are losing value right now, right? Um, I don't think your home, like your home is worth what someone's willing to pay on it, but people buy houses like they buy cars. The consideration is on the monthly, is on the monthly payment, not the debt that they're taking on. Is your home worth $60,000 a year in mortgage payments? That's a question I'm asking a lot of people in the $700,000 range. And the harsh reality is it is not Yeah. right. A lot of people cannot answer that with a yes. Well, and a lot of sellers don't understand that's what their monthly payments going to like the incoming buyer. That's what their payments are looking like. And you look at the seller's eyes when you use that line and their eyes just get like, oh, like it's almost like a light switch. Like, yeah, OK, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Because that is a huge payment. Yeah. What I would tell any like seller thinking about selling is you can't really think about selling until you talk with a well-educated realtor. Mm -hmm. And I want to focus on. The first part of that, well-educated, <laughs> because not every realtor is the same. Not every realtor is able to do the research. You know, any, any sales job has the 80, 20 rule. It's probably different in real estate. It's probably like 10% of us do 90% yeah. of the business. Um, we're not in a marketplace anymore where you can just put it in the MLS and hope to get a good result. I think we're like, incredibly good at what we do. And I'd love to tell you, tell you we've sold every house we've listed for sale this year, but it's just not the truth because the market won't bear the sale of every house and where you might have to price the home to sell it. The harsh reality is you might not be willing to go there. And you know what? That's, that's okay. Right? Sometimes you have to test and we have to have a conversation about it. Um, if someone hires us to sell their house, obviously we're going to give them the real advice on, you know, the information we gather once we're on the market on how to do it. And then they get to make the decision of saying yes or no. But if you want some scenarios, you know, if you're a home seller watching this and you want to have uh, not a, just a conversation about the broad market, but what it really means to be a seller where you live in your area and maybe what some probabilities could be like, we could do that. There's, there's a link in the description below. There's a form you can go to and fill it out and um, tell us, you know, just give us your address and your phone number. We'll call you. We'll have mm -hmm. a conversation about it. Yeah. I mean, every situation is different. So if you want that personalized, like, Hey, what's best for me in my personal situation? Like we pride ourselves on being honest. So yeah. to help guide you. Yeah. Look, Krista has a, historic home in Alameda listed for sale right now. That is the epitome of a fixer. I mean, it's very classic, amazing yeah, cool old home. home that's, you know, had a sale fail. And then we have stuff in the suburbs. So it's, you know, if it's out of our scope, we'll tell you. So mm -hmm. let's shift to buyers right now. And you've been out with a lot of buyers, Krista. Like, you know, if I'm a, I don't want to say first time home buyer, maybe I'm a, we already talked about first time home buyers. If I'm like a move up buyer, Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about, I'm just outgrowing my house and I could stay here for another year or two, but I don't really want to, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to do the updating. I don't want to do the upcoming repairs. Yeah. So I need to sell and buy, you know, what would my, what should I expect as like a buying experience? Maybe I'm buying a little bit above the average sales price, you know, in the burbs. Well, yeah. So let's say you're in the burbs and what, so you're looking 700 ish. 700,000. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and what you're going to have to deal with is what's nice is a lot of those homes are sitting, right? So you're going to have in that $700,000 range, depending on where you're looking, right? You're going to have some more options. Um, but you're going to have to deal with now, or you don't want to be contingent, right? So prepping your home to sell and then finding someone, and you're more likely in this market to get a contingent offer accepted, right? We're seeing that more and more because if you're not getting any offers, you're going to take what you can get. So if you got an offer, you're going to have a contingent offer. You're more likely going to get that accepted. So, th so that yeah. that's good news. Now the deal is though, you're going to need to price your home and get your home ready. Right? 
So that you're really gonna have to make sure that you've got it staged properly. You're gonna make sure that you have it priced, that you're looking at days on market because if you're making a contingent offer, there's a lot of negotiation with how long you're gonna have to get your house under contract. And that, that can be really tricky. And I've seen you know deals fall apart because they get their house pending and then the buyer walks away. And so it's one of those things where you're, you're gonna have to be ready for kind of every situation, which will help, obviously we help you guide, guide you through. But I do think that if you're looking to move up and use the equity that you have, you know, there are a lot of options and you're more likely to get a contingent offer where in the last few years that was probably non-existent. So you have, you have yeah. more options. I, as a real estate professional, and if I was a buyer, I prefer the pace of this market where I could go look at a house and then maybe go look at it again, and then mm -hmm. maybe go look at it again. You know, there are several properties I've been in with clients where we've looked at them two or three or four times, or maybe there was a house pending. You know, I called on a house that was pending and I said, hey, look, if your client just, or if the buyer gets cold feet, I think my mm -hmm. clients would love this house and we'd love to see it. And we got a call on a Thursday you know, afternoon that this transaction might be falling apart. We saw the house Thursday night, and I think two days later, we were in contract, and we're getting ready to close on that house, and my clients are stoked, right? And by the way, they had just lost out negotiating on a house on that street uh, that they felt like was overpriced, and they weren't willing to pay to pay that price, right? So they got on the, the neighborhood on the street they want. The, the pace of this market, I think, is a lot more favorable. And to Chris's point about preparing for for writing a contingent offer, um, we are in a market that requires you to prepare. I think there's like this recency bias. Everyone wants uh, 2021 pace of sales or sales yeah. price, um, but it's gone, right? Yeah. And you're selling to anybody what they're buying is the most expensive asset they've ever purchased, mostly. I mean, that's that's pretty that's a pretty good truism for real estate. When I'm helping people, so what's really scary, right, is when you put your home on the market, it's really, really important for buyers or for sellers to know what the average days on market are, right? And I tell this story, when I sold my house, um, I'd already bought another house, so I was really, I was really nervous, I was stressed out, right, because I don't want to end up with that double mortgage. I don't want that double mortgage payment. So I got my house listed, and I knew that three weeks on the market was average. That was the average days on market. But I was panicking because I wasn't getting any offers. I wasn't getting any offers. And me and my husband were like, okay, maybe we should lower the price. And I'm doing all the things I tell you know my clients not to do. But I was over here kind of panicking, right? Because it's stressful. Selling a house is really, really stressful. Yeah. On that exactly three-week day to the day, I got two offers yeah. and sold for full price. And it, it was knowing those numbers that I had to rely on because I had to look at the math. So I, and that's what, you know, and that I really yeah. hold that true. And so when you list a home, your, your agent should be able to give you those numbers. And it's really interesting when you go and you talk to people and they don't know, and they don't yeah. even know how to look up those stats. Cause that's so well, important when making those, if you're going to make a price adjustment. It's, right? it's, it's so important. It's, you know, real estate, again, it's not a straight line. It's like, a, mm -hmm. it's a custom, it's a custom suit or it's bespoke, right? Like it, it changes, it has to be tailored and your plan might have to adjust a little bit. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just not, sometimes the map is bumpy and sometimes it's mm -hmm. smooth. Um, but let's just, let's just speak to the emotional complexities of what you just talked about. Cause you brought up a real estate transaction. You did uh, real estate's a very emotionally complex transaction. Mm -hmm. I've always said, like, my job's not going to go away until people can see a therapist through AI as well, right? Because <laughs> it's, like, just, it's too emotionally complex. Yeah. Um, I represented Krista on the purchase of her oh, yeah, home. Yeah. And she's like, should I do it myself? And I said, no, because you're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be too whatever. It's going to be like, no, I'm going to represent you. And it's funny because Krista has been selling real estate since 2006. Yeah. I'm mean, licensed 2000, yeah, 2006. And I've been selling real estate since 2007. And you bought your new house in 2020. 20, the 2020. Mine, mine, yeah, the current house, 2020. Yeah. So as the market's getting kind of a little bit silly, mm -hmm. right? And I remember like we're negotiating and she's like, should I do this? Should I do this? She's calling me. Should I do, cause she wanted the house so bad. Should I do this? Should I do this? I'm like, <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Let me do this. Like, like how you'd advise any client, yeah. right? Now here's, here's a woman that at that point had been selling real estate for 13 years, who's helped hundreds of buyers and sellers go through these emotions. But when it's where your family is going to be, it yeah. becomes something very different. 
right? And that's an undermade, an underestimated piece of what we do. I've had a seller going through a hard time, just piecing me up, you know, and then sending me apology texts. Yeah. Yell at me, yell at me, yell at me, apology text. Yeah. Yell at me, <laughs> crazy text message, apology mm-hmm. text. Yeah. Which by the way, he agreed to go to jujitsu with me and I'm gonna put it on him. <laughs> but if you're, if, you're li- if you're listening, <laughs> I'm gonna put it on you. No, um, but hey, you know, it, it is imp- whether it's one of us, whether mm-hmm. it's working with me and Krista or someone from our group or just buying real estate and having an advocate, having, again, not just the average realtor, but a professional real estate agent who's well-educated, who's been doing it, who can clearly articulate the market, who understands the process, who understands the emotional complexities that mm-hmm. isn't just an order taker. You know, Krista could have called another agent in that time period and said, hey, I want to do this. And they would have agent would have just said yes, potentially. And maybe that would have cost her an additional X, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this is this is a challenging business, right? It's challenging to be a buyer or seller. You know, should you be a buyer in this marketplace? It totally depends on your circumstances. Mm-hmm. Should you be a seller? It totally depends on your circumstances. Should you not buy a house because of 7% interest rates? Well, I'm pretty sure 10 years from now, if you buy a house today, you're going to feel like a genius mm-hmm. because historic appreciation would suggest that. Um, if you buy a house today, is your home going to be worth less this time next year? Yes and no. Depends on where you buy. Right? It depends on how you negotiate. It depends on what happens with interest rates. 10 years from now, is your house going to be worth more? I would certainly bet on that. If it's not, we're all in a lot of trouble. We probably got hit by an asteroid. So if you want to talk to Chris or I about buying or selling real estate, There is going to be a link in the description below. If you want to see, if you watch this whole thing, I mean, wow, yeah, feel sorry, almost feel sorry Mm -hmm. for you. (laughs) Um, But we appreciate it. Make make sure make sure you like and subscribe, and maybe just maybe know someone who needs advice, right? Mm -hmm. Like the cool thing about where Chris and I are in our real estate careers, uh, we don't need to sell everyone real estate. Right, like we don't work with everybody. We're not just yes people. Uh, We will give objective advice. Um, That's why we've been able to do this for so long. So uh, we will see you next time.